Hi, my name is Chase, and I am so excited that you're here with us today. If you've been here before, welcome back. If you are a first time guest, Woodbell welcomes you. Go check out our website and fill out a connect card. We would love to learn more about you. If you're here on site with us today, drop by one of the guest lounges in the lobby after the service. There are some really, really nice people excited to meet you and answer any of the questions you may have. We have a gift card to a local coffee shop for you and we will be making a donation to Cheo on your behalf, just as a way of saying thank you for joining us. As we begin our time together today, I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet and join us in a time of worship. Good morning, church. Welcome to Woodville. You guys ready to worship our King this morning? Come on, you ready to worship Him? Let's give Him praise together. Come on.
sing, heal my heart.
faithful. In every season, he's faithful. Through the highs and the lows, he's good. And he loves you and he's there for you. I want us to sing this again. And I just pray. I pray if that's you this morning, this is a little hard to sing this morning. I just want to pray this over you. Speak this over you. Church together, let's do that. Let's sing this over those that are maybe down and discouraged this morning. Amen. Because he is good. He is faithful. He is sovereign. In every season, He is good. Yes, you are, Lord. You never let us down, Lord. Oh, come on, sing it again. He's good. Oh, as you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are.
Road, I will follow Jesus. You may come on, you sing it out. But you are the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that, God, you are the way. Lord, there is no other that we can go to but you. Whether we are in the darkness, in the deep darkness, or dead in our sins, God, you are still the way to our salvation. God, you are still the way to our freedom. God, you are still the way to all that we need. So, Lord, we come to the only one who's able and say, God, have your way. 
Lord, would you have your way? We lay it all down and say, not my way, that's right, that's right. but the way, your way. Would you move in healing? Would you move in power? Would you move in restoration? Would you work a mighty work this morning? Yes, but Lord, at the end of it all, have your way. Amen. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. It is great to be in the house of the Lord together today. And I have the honor to welcome one of our global workers, Lynn. She's going to take a few moments to share. You can maybe be seated. And she's just going to share a little bit about what she's doing and how God is using her overseas. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Woodvale Church. I feel like I've come home. I love it in this place. The worship in this place is anointed. The music is amazing, but it's the worship that's coming from the pews that are welcoming the Holy Spirit. This house is full of the Holy Spirit this morning. It's a beautiful place. Huh. Huh. I've been reading in James, and um, I didn't get very far. <laughs> he took me to James 1, chapter 2, and he said, Consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I, re I, I look at my Bible and I see that I didn't underline that scripture. It's not the one I wanted to read again and again. A little further on, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But... That's not the one he brought to my attention. We all like the one that says if we pray for wisdom, we're going to get it, right? But no, he talked about, he brought me to consider it pure joy that the trials and the perseverance, excuse me, consider that pure joy, pure joy, pure, powerful, undiluted, strong, potent, joy. Joy is what we're to be thinking of in times of trial and perseverance. It's an amazing thing. So um, I'm grateful to be in this house. I've been, Woodvale has journeyed with me for the last 10 years. I'm in a small place in Southeast Asia. I've been sent there for the purpose of anti-human trafficking um, and to bring the good news. I'm in a nation where Jesus is not commonly known. And you got to know, there's, there's so much human trafficking there. If Jesus isn't there, how are they ever going to get healed? How is it ever going to stop? It can't. So I, my mandate is to, to fight human trafficking, but more, more importantly, to bring Jesus into the middle of that dark place. I can tell you that it's been a long road. It's been a long journey. But things are moving. There is breakthrough happening. There is breakthrough coming. And people are being healed. And people are being saved. And I'm grateful, Woodvale Church, because you're a big part of that. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. I just want to ask you to stretch out your hand. We're going to pray for Lynn right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Lynn. We are thank you that you have called her. You have made a plan for her and a purpose. And you opened doors for her. You have put this on her heart, God, and she goes and she serves. She heard your call and she went, Lord. So we thank you for her life. We thank you for her obedience. We thank you for her sacrifice. And right now we just pray for a blessing upon her life, God. We pay, pray for favor in Jesus' name. We pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak through her, that she can be Jesus to so many hurting people. So we thank you for her life in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can turn your attention to the screen. Good morning, Woodvale family. There are a few upcoming events that I am excited to share with you. And to stay up to date on everything that's happening here at Woodvale, be sure to visit our website. This Saturday, our Woodvale Men's Ministry is hosting a breakfast for men of all ages. This is a great opportunity for you to come together as men and connect with one another over a meal and an encouraging word. 
Visit woodvale.ca slash sign up for more details and to register. Next Sunday, February 11th, there is a special opportunity for our Woodvale kids to attend a water baptism class that's created just for them. This class is for kids in grade one to five and will last about 30 minutes after each morning service. Visit woodvale.ca slash sign up to learn more and to sign up. On February 17th, Woodvale Connect Groups is hosting a meetup for our singles aged 30 plus. We're excited to host an event, Race to Connection. This community building and interactive experience is designed to foster connections and teamwork. Be sure to visit woodvale.ca slash sign up to learn more and register. We believe that the giving of our tithes and offerings is an act of worship. And if you've come prepared to give today, visit woodvale.ca slash give, or after the service, you can drop by one of the giving kiosks in the lobby or use an offering bucket at the doors of the auditorium. As you give today, take a moment and let it be an expression of worship to the one who has given you all that you have. I hope that you enjoy the rest of today's service. Bye. Hi. <laughs> well, good morning. How many people are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Yeah. I want to give a shout out welcome to all of our guests that have joined us on site and our guests that have joined us online from our city, our nation, and from around the world. Can we give it up right now for all of our guests? Yeah. Honestly, we are so pumped, so honored, so delighted you chose to be here today. If you're our guest, we want to honor you and bless you at the end of the service. Would you be so kind to go in the main lobby after the service, look for a banner that says guests, you can't miss it, and let us have the joy of giving you a coffee card for a local coffee shop. It's our way of saying thank you for coming. And something else we're going to do automatically on behalf of every first-time guest, we are going to make a donation to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Well, how many people are ready for God's Word? Come on, you're ready for God's Word? Well, this morning, we're going to start our February sermon series. It's on the book of 2 Timothy. It's not even a creative title, 2 Timothy. And some people ask me all the time, they say, Pastor, how do you choose a sermon series? What, what leads you? What directs you? I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't choose this book. It chose me. I couldn't get away from it. It was speaking to me loud about where we are as a church and where we're going and what God is doing. And I saw so many truths in it that I knew that it was a book that I needed to expound on over these next four Sundays. There are three things that we're going to do this morning. In a couple of moments, I'm going to give you five fast facts about 2 Timothy, just so you can understand what it's about. Then number two, I'm going to give you an outline. It's almost like an outline, chapter one, two, three, four. And then I'm going to leave you with five pastoral principles that I believe God wants to say to us today. But I know you've been standing for a while, but could you stand one more time? I just want to pray that God would take the living word and make it a rhema word for our life and our church. So come on, church, lift up your hands all across this place. Father God, these people love you, and because they love you, they love your word. So God, take your written word, make it a living word. Let nothing stop what you want to do in our hearts and in this place today. We pray, God, that your word would come to life and transform us in Jesus' name. We pray, God, as we come to communion at the end and then believing for salvation and the supernatural, that the windows of heaven would open over this place to God be the glory. Jesus' name, somebody shouted amen. amen. I said somebody shouted amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together and give it up for our Jesus. Amen. 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 We'll take a seat in God's presence. Turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 1 or your handheld device, I want you to go with me through the scripture this morning and let's see what the Spirit of the Lord would say to us. Number one, five fast facts about 2 Timothy. I want to read to you verse one and verse two because I think it sets the tone. In verse one, it says, Paul. Everybody say Paul. One, two, three. Paul. He wrote the book. He wrote 2 Timothy. An apostle. He's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Can I talk to you for a moment about the will of God for your life and for this church? There are two kinds of wills when it comes to God. There is his perfect will, and then there is permissive will. His perfect will is his divine plan, his blueprint, what he really ordained for us, what he wants us to step into. It's, it's God's blueprint. It's the perfect will of God. The permissive will is when, we, when God allows something to happen because of our free will. 
I don't want God just to allow something because of our free will. I want my free will to line up with his perfect plans so that I as your pastor and we as a church and you as an individual experience the perfect will of God. If you're with me, give a clap offering of praise to God. The perfect will of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It was the will of God that he would be an apostle. It was the perfect will of God. In keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, it's always about Jesus. I want you, when you walk out this morning, when someone says, what did the pastor preach on? You say, Jesus. When they ask you, what did he preach on last week? You say, come on, say it, Jesus. Next week, what's the sermon going to be about? Jesus. It's always about Jesus. Look at verse 2. To Timothy. Everybody say Timothy. One, two, three. Timothy. Paul was an older man. Timothy was a young man. Timothy was a spiritual son. He mentored him. He poured into him. He said, my dear son, not biological son, but spiritual son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Five fast facts. Number one, 2 Timothy was Paul's final book. Did you know that Paul wrote over half the New Testament, but his last letter is 2 Timothy. It's his final words, and final words are important words. It's his final book. Number two, when Paul wrote it, he wasn't sitting in the Holiday Inn. He was actually in a prison. He was in prison. When you read the book of Acts, everywhere Paul went, there was either a revival or a riot. And he was often thrown into prison because he was standing for Jesus. By the time this book is written, it's now close to 66 AD. And he's in prison for the final time. And he's waiting his death. He, many people believe, I can't prove it, but many believe he was beheaded for his faith in AD 66. And, um, and, and, and uh, he just stood strong for the Lord. It's like he's on death row. And so when he wrote this letter, it's not metaphorically and symbolically he's in prison. He was actually in prison awaiting death when he wrote this letter to Timothy. Number three, the church was in a crisis situation. When I read the book of Acts, the church grew explosively. It started with 120 in an upper room. Remember Acts chapter 1? And they're praying. Then Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came and the church was birthed. Peter gets up, preach a powerful message. 3,000 people got saved. Come on. They had church that Sunday, amen? Come on. They had church that Sunday, amen? 3,000 people got saved. It's now 3,120, and it started to grow and grow and grow. By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, 25 years have gone by, and the church is about 250,000 people. But in A.D. 64, Nero, oh, this guy was a wicked leader. He burned Rome, and he blamed the Christians. And the persecution was there, but from A.D. 64 on, it went on steroids, And he was all out to kill the Christians and persecute the Christians and torture the Christians. And so all of a sudden, the fickle followers of Jesus bailed. Only the faithful people stood because people are like, whoa, if I got to be a Christian, does that mean I got to go to jail? I'm out. If I'm going to be a Christian, it means I'm going to be martyred. I'm definitely out. If I'm going to be a Christian, I'm, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be brutally beaten for my faith. And many deserted their faith, but not Paul. Nero burns Rome, blames the Christians. They're in a huge crisis situation. Not just that heresy was slipping into the church. False teachers were coming in, watering down the gospel, twisting the word of God, and teaching things that weren't found in the scripture. And the church was in a crisis situation. Number four, Paul was totally abandoned and virtually all alone in Rome. All, everybody bailed, out of sight, out of mind. He's in jail. And apparently the only one that was with him was Luke. God bless Luke. Luke was at his side, but he's all alone. Have you ever felt all alone? You ever felt forgotten? You ever felt you gave your all for Jesus, but now everybody left you? There's Paul in prison, all alone. And he writes his final letter to Timothy, and the church is in crisis. But number five, here's the biggie. Timothy represents the up and coming next generation. He represents the generation that is beyond Paul. Paul's an elderly man. Timothy's probably in his 20s. He's a a young man. 
Now, I don't know if you know this about this church, but 70% of this church is under the age of 40. Come on. Somebody celebrate that. I think that's absolutely cool. And Evelyn and I, over the years, have visited churches, and, and I've got several churches in my mind. You don't need to know where, but they were 75 years of age and up, for the most part, with a sprinkle of a young family. They're like 10 years away from extinction and being done. I'm glad to be a part of a church that believes in the next generation. I, I, have, I have people in this city. Come on, you can go ahead and celebrate that. That's good. That's good. I... I go to a local gym six days a week, and I've met a lot of people, and some are coming to our church and come to Jesus, and there's some board members from other churches of other denominations talking to me, scratching their head, going, we don't get it. Our church isn't growing. Everybody's over 75. What's your secret? Well, it's not that complicated. Let me give you a few truths. Number one, you got to preach the Word of God. you got to preach the truth of the Word of God. You'd be leery of anybody you're watching on the internet that gives you a few good thoughts and sprinkles one little verse in at the end. you got to preach the whole counsel of the Word of God and be true to the gospel message. Come on, you can celebrate that. Amen. <laughs> Secondly, you've got to go for the unchurch. And thirdly, you've got to reach out to the next generation. Now, I make no apologies. We design our worship for the next generation. I think it's pretty cool to see all these young people coming to the front and just dancing before the Lord. Amen. Come on. I think it's pretty cool. And some people go, well, this isn't my style of worship. But here's what I say to people. I go, we are trying to create a church that your children and your grandchildren want to experience. And I know you want your children and your grandchildren in the house of the Lord. Now, this coming summer is the Summer Olympics. It's going to be in Paris. And one of my favorite races is the four by 100 meters relay. Four guys, four ladies, four guys or four ladies, and one would run the 100 meters and they'd hold the baton. Remember that metal baton? And they'd hand it to the next person. They'd run the 100 meters, hand it to the next person, hand it to the next person, and, and whoever got there the quickest one. I'm told that the race isn't won based on how it starts or how it ends, but on the passing of the baton. If the baton is bobbling, they're going to lose a second. If the one slows down, they're going to lose. They've got to pass it as they're running the same speed. And if they drop it, now here's the deal, church. Uh, we, my generation, needs to understand that we got to pass a spiritual baton to the next generation. My Bible says in the last days, God is going to pour out his spirit on our sons and our daughters. I pray that the next generation would do more for the kingdom of God than my generation in the name of the Lord. And I pray that we would pass on a spiritual baton of a hunger and a thirst for the living God. Amen. Come on, somebody give a clap offering of praise to our God. Amen. So Paul's up in years. He's, he's on death row. He's going to be beheaded for his faith. He's got one more letter to write. And he writes young Timothy, who represents the next generation. He wanted to pass a spiritual baton. He wanted the gospel message and the kingdom of God to keep going. He wanted the next generation to do more for the kingdom of God than his generation. Amen. And so I want you to know that Timothy represents the next generation. Let me take you to number two. If you like an outline, here it comes quickly. The four appeals of 2 Timothy. Chapter one is the pastoral appeal. You're going, we're going to learn today, it's really pastoral. It's all pastoral. Number one, chapter one, the pastoral appeal. Chapter two is the practical appeal. Can't wait for next Sunday. It is so practical when we read chapter two. Number three, you're going to love chapter three. It's the prophetic appeal. And he starts talking about end times. It's a powerful chapter. And then lastly, chapter four, it's the personal appeal. Paul is really personal. It goes from pastoral to practical to prophetic to personal. I say all that to take you to the heart of the message. And for a couple of moments today, I want to share with you five pastoral principles from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, down to verse 18. So let's get right into it. Number one. Remember your heritage. Never forget your spiritual 
heritage. I'm going to read these few verses. They're going to share with you a true story. Verse 3 down to verse 5. Paul says, I thank God whom I serve. He served God, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. He had a lot of time on his hands. He's in prison, and he's praying for young Timothy, the guy he's spiritually mentoring. He's praying for him night and day. Look at verse 2. I recall your tears, recalling your tears. They had such a bond. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Every time Paul was with Timothy, there was joy because Paul saw saw the potential in Timothy. He saw potential in the next generation. Look at verse 5. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Sincere means authentic. It means genuine. It means real. It first lived in your grandmother Lois, and it was in, it's in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Come on, Timothy. You had a godly mom. You had a godly grandmother. They passed the spiritual baton. Your grandma raised your mom in the things of Jesus, and your mama's raised you in the things of Jesus. The spiritual baton's been passed to you. Let me tell you a story. My father has lineage of Christianity that goes way back. My great-grandfather gave his heart to Jesus, got saved, healed, baptized in water, baptized in the Spirit, was part of a, the founding of a, a Pentecostal church in the city where I was raised. And my, my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother raised their two children. One was my grandma, who fell in love with this German guy from, from the Kitchener area, got married, had 10 kids. One is my father. My father meets my mom on a blind date. They have three children, two of them who are adopted, twin sisters who are adopted. And there's been a spiritual lineage of salvation and Christianity. I'm grateful for parents who have raised me in my faith, raised me in the faith, and I'm grateful for godly grandparents. Now, church, if you've got a godly heritage, don't take it for granted. Celebrate, celebrate it. Come on, celebrate it. Now, my mom's side of the story is totally different. My great, I'm sorry, my grandpa McDermott came on a boat from Glasgow, Scotland, meets a lady here, marries her, has one child, my mom. My grandpa was an alcoholic. He was messed up, but Jesus saved him. My mom was invited to a crusade. She gave her heart to the Lord. My grandma gave her heart to the Lord. My mom comes home, nine-year-old girl, gets on her knees, prays to Jesus, and she said, Jesus, if you can save me, save Say, Daddy. And my grandpa came home drunk as can be. My mom's hiding in the washroom. He was abusive. But the power of Holy Spirit convicted Gramps. He got on his knees during the wee hours of the morning, gave his heart to Jesus, poured the alcohol down the drain. Not only got saved, got set free from alcohol. Now, if you're sitting here today and you're like, I don't have a godly heritage, start one in the name of Jesus. Just because your mom and your daddy were far from God and bound by drugs and bound by alcohol, you don't have to have the same curse on you. Break it in the name of Jesus. You pass on a godly heritage. You pass on a godly heritage to your children. You raise them in the house of the Lord. You point them to Jesus in the name of the Lord. Somebody give a clap offering of praise to Jesus. Now get ready for this. Some of you heard this story, but most of you haven't. It was 2003. We were newly here. We came in 2001. It's, it's August. And our senior high young people just come, came home from youth camp. And in those days, they went to Lakeshore Camp in Coburg. And they came back in cars, got in the lobby, and they brought the speaker back. Her name is Joyce Heron. And Joyce is from Vancouver, and she's catching her plane in Ottawa. So all of our young people brought Joyce back. And I met Joyce. And I sat with Joyce in the old lobby. I said, Joyce, tell me about yourself. Now, you need to hear this. The story got really weird the more we talked. Because all of a sudden, she starts telling me about her grandparents. And she mentions this small little community in Ontario on Lake Huron called Point Clark. Most of you, if not all of you, never heard of that. And I said, Point Clark. I said, my grandma and my grandpa lived in Point Clark. She said, so did my grandma and my grandpa. And before long, as she's sharing the story, I realized, we realized that her grandpa and my grandpa were brothers. 
I hugged her and I said, we're related. <laughs> I've never met you. So I shared with her the story of my grandpa, how Jesus set him free from alcohol, how God brought him on a boat to Canada and brought my mom and my grandma to a crusade and they got saved and how the, how the darkness was broken and he began to raise my mama and Jesus and my mama raised me and Jesus and we raised our family in Jesus and she began to share her story how she's a first generation Christian and she broke the chain of darkness and the curse that was on her life. She broke it in the name of Jesus. I went home and I called my mom. I said, Mom, Joyce Heron, do you know who she is? She said, yeah. <laughs> I heard Joycey came to Jesus. I said, Joycey came to Jesus? She's an evangelist in the nation of Canada. She just preached at youth camp at Lakeshore Camp. The power of God is on her life. Hear me, church. I don't know what your past is, but God's got a destiny and a future over your life in the name of Jesus. Whew. The second thing I want to talk to you about, oh boy, here we go. Rekindle your spiritual gift. Rekindle it. Let me read verse 6 and verse 7. Paul said, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, don't miss this. He doesn't tell Timothy to start a fire. He calls Timothy to stir up the fire that is already in him. He said, I remind you, fan into flame, rekindle the fire, stir the fire of the gift, the charisma gift of God that is already in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy, I'm passing the spiritual baton to you. You're saved. There's gifts of God in you. Stir them up, stir them up, stir them up, stir them up, stir them up in the name of Jesus. I want you to look this way. If you're a child of the living God, you've got at least one spirit gift in you and probably more. There are three categories of gifts in the Bible. There's the ministry gifts, and then there's the motivational gifts, and then there's the manifestational gifts. The ministry gifts are found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, down to verse 13. There's five of them. There's the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist. And those are roles that God raises people up and they connect to the church. The apostle establishes the church. The apostle starts things and God uses them as a pioneer and they begin new ministries. They begin new things. There's an apostolic anointing on them. They establish the church. The prophet enlightens the church, comes with a word from God hears from heaven and enlightens the church with a prophetic voice. The pastor encourages the church. The teacher educates the church. And God uses the evangelist to enlarge the church. We need the apostolic anointing. We need the pastoral anointing. We need the prophetic anointing. We need the teacher anointing. We need the evangelistic anointing. Not one of those is above the other. All gifts are equally important and needed in the body of Christ. Come on, you can give a clap offering of praise to God. <laughs> Prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist, five of them. The motivational gifts are found in Romans and Corinthians and 1 Peter. It's like mercy and leading and administration, and the list goes on. Those are spirit gifts, administration. Yes, it's a spirit gift. Mercy is a spirit gift. Leading is a spirit gift. 
And then you've got the manifestational gifts found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there's nine of them. Let me list a few of them. One is the, the gift of supernatural faith. The other is the gift of miracles. Another is the gift of wisdom. Another is the gift of knowledge. Another is the gift of discernment. The other is the gift of tongues, which needs to be followed by the gift of the interpretation of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And all of those nine manifestation gifts are needed in the church. If you add it up, there's about 28 gifts mentioned in the New Testament. I think there's more. I think it was just a sample. But you need to hear me. Look, look, look this way. God has given you at least one gift. And God is saying to this church today that these gifts need to be stirred up in the name of Jesus. We're not going to light a fire. There's already a fire of the gift in you. We need to fan and to flame the gift that's in you. Now look this way. God is doing things in this church that we never thought possible in the darkness of COVID. I'm so down and discouraged and God gave me the word that I've shared and the word was, hold on, stay the course, Mark. Stay the course. And the other thing the Lord said to me, I'm about to do some things that you've never thought possible. Now you need to hear me and I'm blown away by this and it's not about numbers but every number represents a soul. Last Sunday in the house of the Lord on site, there was just shy of 2,008 100 people in church. Come on, last Sunday. When we look at what we were running before COVID started, we are actually over 40% more than we were pre-COVID. God is up to something. Every staff meeting, we take time to I say to the past, it's celebrate win time. Give me a win. Give me a fresh win. And this past Tuesday, Pastor Kimberly shared a win that happened the Wednesday before at Alpha. Now, a week ago, not this past Wednesday, a week ago, it was a snowstorm. Should we cancel? Should we have it? And the weather turned out to be good. We had it. There was lots of junior hires, lots of kids, lots in the follow class, lots in Alpha. And in Alpha, get ready for this, in Alpha... We're told that 10 people lifted their hand to give their heart to Jesus on a snowy, come on, on a snowy, wintry night. Last Sunday, Pastor Matt told me 40 people who responded to salvation went to the follow wall to get their Bible. Come on, somebody give God the glory and the honor. God is up to something so big in this place, and he said to me to say to you as your pastor, all hands on deck. Everybody is needed. If you're saved, God wants to use you. God is not looking for an audience. He's looking for an army. And God is saying to me to say to you, we need to stir up the gift that's already in you. Now look this way. If you don't let the gift be stirred up, an unused gift equals an unmet need. Oh God, stir up the gifts in Jesus' name. God is up to something big. We need everybody. So let me put some legs to this. Coming up. On the fourth Sunday of this month, it's prayer night. Last Sunday night was prayer. Come on, it was so cool, the house of the Lord. It was great. The lower level was filled, and there's people up in the balconies on a prayer night. Come on. Someone give them praise for that. We give them glory. <laughs> but on the fourth Sunday of this month, 6 o'clock prayer, at about 7.15, we're going to offer Woodville Serves. We've, we've, we've shortened it. We've made it more simplistic. We made it easier to get you serving. And if you are not serving, we, oh, church, we need you all hands on deck. Every Sunday morning, your pastoral team gets here early, and we're walking through the building because there's so much. We're walking through the building between services. I mean, what God's doing is beyond what we can sometimes even manage. We need all hands on deck. If we don't do that, we're going to stifle what God wants to do, and I'm convicted by this. If we stifle what God wants to do, Jesus is coming back soon. we got to do all we can to win people for Jesus. We don't want to stop someone from coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
So on that fourth Sunday of this month, right after prayer, Woodvale serves. We're going to do it in 305. But Pastor Matt, I think the room's so small. We'll have to figure it out. Maybe it'll be right here. You come if you're not serving. We're going to walk you through something. We're going to help you discover where God wants you to serve. And we're going to help develop those gifts. And we're going to deploy you because all hands on deck. Uh, oh, friend, friend, everybody, everybody, whether you're a senior, a junior higher, all hands on deck. The best is yet to come, and God wants to use you. Oh, Lord, stir it up in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The third thing I want to share with you is refuse to be intimidated. Sometimes people say to me, what in this crazy world are we allowed to say as a church? Wrong question. I'm not concerned what we're allowed to say. I'm more concerned what does Jesus Christ, the living head of this church, want us to say in Jesus' name. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Paul's day, Fickle followers left their faith, and only the faithful stood strong. And Paul said to Timothy, come on, Timothy. God's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So let me read to you verse 6 and verse 7. He said, for this reason, Timothy, I remind you, fan into flame the gift that's in you. Come down to verse 8. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, Timothy. Don't be ashamed about it. Or don't be ashamed of me his prisoner. Don't be embarrassed that I'm in prison. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. You're going to suffer by the power of God. Last week, we talked about stepping into a new anointing. A new level means a new devil. And as God uses us, the devil is going to kick hard. But we are not afraid of Satan because greater is Jesus who's in us than the devil who is roaming through this world. We have an authority in Jesus. Jesus, come on, someone give a clap offering of praise to God. It's the power of God. Look at verse 9. It gets really doctrinal. He saved us. Anybody glad that he saved you? Amen. He called us to a holy life. Watch this. You are saved and called. First, not called to do something, but called to be something. He called you to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Thank the Lord for the grace of God. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus even before the beginning of time. Anybody glad for the grace of God? Come on, is anybody glad for the grace of God? Look at verse 10. It's now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Let me say this to you. Paul wasn't afraid of being in jail. He knew that even if they took their life, they couldn't take his soul. He knew that if he lived, he wins. If he dies, he wins. He knew that when he breathed his last breath on earth, he was going to step into eternity in heaven. The devil could kick hard and destroy his body, the shell, but the devil could not destroy his inner spirit because he knew that he was in Christ and he knew he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted not just to live for Jesus, but he was willing to die for Jesus. He wasn't going to be intimidated and I prophetically declare that in these last days, the best is yet to come. These are the best of times. These are the worst of times and the devil is going to kick hard and Canada is going to get off the moral tracks and there's going to be a lot of stuff that you're going to shake your head at but God is saying to his church rise up with boldness in the name of Jesus and stand on the word of the living God and never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ never be ashamed of Jesus and what he's done do not be intimidated God's not giving you the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind somebody give a shout of praise to Jesus in this place today Hallelujah. 
Look at verse 11 of this gospel. Gospel, the good news. I was appointed. You need to hear me. Paul was appointed and anointed. Here's his three gifts. A herald, an apostle, a teacher. A herald means an evangelist. He, he was there to enlarge the church as an apostle, to establish the church, as a teacher, to educate the church. He knew the giftings that God had supernaturally placed in them. And he was confident. Look at verse 12. That's why I'm suffering as I am. New level, new devil. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed. Watch it. He didn't say I know what I believe. He didn't say I know why I believe. You got to know what you believe and you got to know why you believe. But before you know what you believe and why you believe, you got to know who you believe in. And he said, I know, I know whom I have believed. Anybody know the name of the one in whom he believed? Come on, somebody shout it out. Anybody know the name? Jesus. Jesus. I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him unto that day, and I shall not be intimidated. I'm going to stand strong for God, and God is saying to his church, stand strong for Jesus. Stand strong for Jesus in the name of the Lord. Somebody give a shout of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number four, recommit to the gospel message. You get leery of preachers that don't open their Bibles, give you a few thoughts and a few cliches, but no scripture. Look at verse 13 and 14. Paul said, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern. The pattern means the blueprint of sound teaching. The actual word is doctrine. The pattern of doctrine. The blueprint of doctrine. And in the Bible, every time it says sound teaching or doctrine, it's never in the plural because there's only one doctrine and there's only one sound teaching. And by the way, there's only one way to heaven through Jesus Christ. I hope you're not shocked by this. Chrislam is not real. It's not the blending of Islam and Christianity. There's only one way to heaven through Jesus Christ. You can only get to heaven through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Somebody give a shout of praise in this place. Possibly what you've heard from me, keep as the pattern, the blueprint of sound teaching, the doctrine, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. 14, guard the good deposit. Guard it, guard it, guard it, Timothy. The baton is the word of God. The baton is the truth of God. Timothy, it was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Anybody glad for the Holy Spirit who lives in us? And the Spirit who's in us is the the spirit who comes upon us and the spirit who comes upon us who's in us is the spirit who works through us who helps us to pass on the spiritual baton to the next generation and I pray that the next generation would know the word of God even more than my generation I pray that the next generation would have a greater anointing of God on them than my generation I pray mill miracles will happen through the next generation God light the fire Stir the gifts in our children. Stir the gifts in our youth. Stir it in our young adults in the name of Jesus. People say to me, how, 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 how would God want to grow the church? I'll tell you, you start with the children. When you've got a strong, solid children's ministry, it means you're going to have a strong junior high ministry because they're going to become junior hires. And when you've got a strong junior high ministry, it means you're going to have a strong senior high ministry. And when you've got a strong senior high ministry, it means you're going to have a, a strong young adult ministry. And when you've got a strong young adult ministry, it means you're going to have a strong adult ministry. And when you've got a strong adult ministry, it means you're going to have a strong seniors ministry. And those seniors are going to say, I don't understand the worship. I don't know where all the hymns have gone, but I see and feel the presence of God in this place. And I see the fire of God burning in this place. And I'm leaving my preference at the door because I want to see the next generation with the anointing and the fire of God upon them. Somebody give a shout of praise in this place. Whew. Hallelujah. Lastly, number five, respond to God's call in your life. 
And in these final moments, I'm going to invite you to stand as I land this preaching plane. And then as I give an invitation for salvation, and we have communion, then we open the altar for the supernatural. Look at verse 15. Paul said to Timothy, you know, come on, Timothy, you know that everyone in the province of Asia, they've deserted me. I'm alone, out of sight, out of mind. Including the jealous and Hermogenes. Now, now, these guys were key leaders in the church, but they were fickle in their faith, and they bailed on Paul, and they walked away because they couldn't handle the persecution, and they weren't willing to stand strong for God, so they ran. They weren't the only ones to run, but Paul called these two names out. I'll tell you why. He had a high D personality, and a high D personality is outgoing and direct. A high D personality is demanding and decisive and a doer. Any, any high D personalities in the place that you all admit it? That's me. Like, you're proud of it. I'm a high D. He's in their face. He called them out. And come on, think it through. He called them out, and the Holy Spirit arranged it for those two dudes' names to be mentioned in the word of the Lord. And they bailed. You know, everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including the jealous and homogenous. Look at verse 16 in contrast, but may the Lord show mercy to the household of this guy, Onesiphorus. Because he often did something. He often refreshed me. When he came into my presence, it wasn't worse. It was better. He always lifted my spirit. He refreshed me. And he was not ashamed of my chains. He was not embarrassed that I'm in jail. Verse 17, on the contrary, when he was in Rome, he really searched hard for me until he found me. And may the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Church, look this way. God's got a call on your life. You are anointed. You are appointed. There are gifts gifts of the Spirit in you. I want to circle back to a vision that I've shared before, and it really needs to be sounded again. Several years back, I'm not accustomed to prophetic dreams, but I've had a prophetic dream, the same dream, numerous times over a season of months, a number of years ago. And I was walking downstairs in what was the old building, and I walked down an old hallway that's now been renovated. I got to the end of it, and there were some doors that I didn't recognize, and I thought, where do these doors come from? I'm in my dream. What's behind it? And the doors were old and cobwebs were on the door. And I remember in my dream grabbing the doors and it was hard to open the doors. But I eventually got the doors open and I walked in and there was the biggest room that I've ever seen. It was even bigger than the main auditorium. And it was dark and dingy and cold. And I'm, I'm like, nobody told me we had this room. Where did this come from? We need this room. We need this space. Why aren't we using this space? Boof, I'd wake up. But a week or so later, I had the same prophetic dream. Then a week or so later, the same prophetic dream. It's like God was trying to get my attention. And I sat down with some of the intercessors, and I said, here's the dream I'm getting. I, I, I think it might be about the building expansion. They said, Pastor, the building expansion has to happen, but we don't sense it's about the building expansion. We sense it's about the gifts of the Spirit. I said, talk to me. They said, God has appointed you and anointed you as the pastor. And, and like that big dark room, it represents the unused gifts of the Spirit in this church. And I got to the doors, and they said, you're the one to open the doors. You're the one to teach it. You're the one to fan it into flame. And I opened the doors. And, and they said, Pastor, there's unused gifts in this place. And God wants that room to be open. And he wants all those gifts to be used. I got goosebumps as I'm saying this right now. And I feel the Spirit of the Lord saying to me that there's going to be an anointing of God that's going to sweep in this place. And he's saying, I'm looking for an army, not an audience. So I tell you, Woodvale serves. Woodvale serves. It's got everybody on deck. We need everybody doing something for the kingdom of God. Or we're going to bottleneck what God's doing. Uh, look around. I can't believe what God is up to. I can't believe what God is doing. It's beyond what I can ever imagine. But I'm not going to sit back, stop. I, church, I'm telling you right now, I believe that the best is yet to come. People, people, my colleagues say to me, Mark, how long have you and Evelyn been? pastoring in the city of Ottawa. I used to say how many years, but I have a new word. I now say just 23 years. Just. 
I feel like we've just begun. I feel like there's so much more. I feel like God is up to something so big in this city. And I, I prophetically declare there's a fire of God that is burning. And I believe God is going to send revival to this city and to this nation. And something is starting. I don't use these words lightly and I don't put a label on it. Some people say, is Whitfield in revival? I don't like labels. All I know is God is doing something in this place that I don't fully understand and I don't have to understand. I just need to lean in and listen and say, Lord, it's your church. Do whatever you want. Come on, someone give a shout of praise in this place today. Hallelujah. Every head is bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. I'm asking that no one would leave unless it's absolutely urgent. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I've got a question for you. If today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity, do you know, sir, do you know, ma'am, do you know where you will spend eternity? Uh, are you going to heaven? I don't want you to think you're going to heaven or hope you're going to heaven. I want you to walk out of this place knowing beyond any shadow of doubt that if today was the day that you died, you're going to heaven. The only way to heaven is through a personal relationship with Jesus. Was there a time that you said, Jesus, come into your life your salvation experience needs to be personal but your testimony needs to be public but have you personally said Jesus come into my life going to church doesn't get you to heaven giving in the offering doesn't get you to heaven reading your Bible doesn't get you to heaven you've got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and ask him to be the center of your life in just a moment I'm gonna to count to three and I believe that there's literally a large number of people in the second morning service that you're like, I, I don't know if I'm ready for heaven. I, I'm not ready for heaven, but I want to be ready for heaven. In just a couple of moments, I'm going to count to three. And if you'd like to be included and led in a prayer to receive Jesus, all I want you to do after I count to three is lift your hand high as you can. Then you can put it down. And by lifting your hand, you're, you're letting me know, Pastor, I, I want to go to heaven. I want to be ready for heaven. I want to be led in this prayer. So let's do this. One, two, three. If that's you, you just lift your hand high as you can and by lifting your hand here let me know I, I want to be led in this prayer there's a lot of hands going up all across this place over in the risers way up on the balcony I see your hands I see your hands I see your hands I see your hands over in the risers yeah I see your hands over in the main level I see your hands all across this place you can put your hands down just five more seconds anybody else you've not lifted your hand but you want to be led and included in this prayer four more seconds anyone else I don't want I want you to miss this moment. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. For those of you who lifted your hand, I want to lead you in this prayer. And we're going to join you. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. Today. Today. I confess you. I confess you. As my Savior. As my and my Lord. And my Lord. I, want to live for you I want to live for you and serve you, and serve you. all the days of my life. All the days I pray this now I pray this in, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, Whitfield, it's party time. Come on. Come on, it's party time. <laughs> There's a lot of people that gave their heart to Jesus in the 9 o'clock and now in the 1115 service. And if that's you, you made the best decision of your life. And if you don't attend a life-giving, Bible-believing church, we'd love to have you join us at Woodville. But here's something I want you to do. On the way out, tell someone the decision you made. Drop by the table in the lobby that says follow. We want to give you a Bible. It's free. And we want to tell you how we can help you in your new faith journey. And, and again, if you don't attend a life-giving, Bible-believing church, we'd be honored if you joined us in the journey. And we give God thanks. Come on, one more time, church. Celebrate <laughs> salvation. The supernatural. How many people believe Jesus still heals? Do you believe that? Come on, do you believe that? Oh, that was really weak. How many people believe Jesus still heals? How many believe Jesus can still set captives free? 
He can open blind eyes. He can take your fear. He can take your anxiety. He can remove the addiction. He can do a miracle in your marriage. He can do a miracle in your family. He can do a miracle in your finances. Nothing is impossible with God. I want the altar workers, the pastors, the board members. Come on, get up here as quick as you can, pastors, board members. Come on, altar workers, come on, come on. Get up here as quick as you can, because in just a moment, we're going to open this altar, and we're going to believe for the supernatural. And Pastor Brad, you're going to lead us in that powerful song, I just speak the name of Jesus, and we're going to speak the most powerful name in this place, because Jesus is in the house, amen. Come on, how many people, you need a miracle from God. Lift your hand as high as you can. Do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle? Do you need God to show up? and do something. Uh, I want everyone now just to lift your hands and I'm going to pray. And after I pray, if you need a miracle, I want you to come to this altar and press in as close as you can to the front because there's going to be a lot of people coming to this altar. And we're going to speak the name of Jesus. I want you as a church to pray. Pray that song and speak the name of Jesus over these wonderful people. So God, come on, lift your hands. God, I pray the windows of heaven would open over this place. I pray the supernatural would happen in this house. I pray sick bodies would be healed. I pray cancer would be gone. Tumors would shrink and be gone in the name of Jesus. Headaches would be gone in the name of Jesus. Back pain would be gone in the name of Jesus. Blood disorders would be healed in the name of Jesus. Prodigal sons and daughters would come home in the name of Jesus. Drug addicts in our families would be set free. We're going to come, Lord. We're going to stand in proxy for their miracle. We're going to stand in proxy for our son, for our daughter. We're going to come and stand in proxy for our brother, our sister. Jesus, we speak miracles in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Come on, someone say amen. Amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Somebody say Jesus in this place. Somebody give a clap offering of praise right now to our God, to our God, to our God. I I just feel the Lord say to me, as we begin to sing this song, I Speak Jesus, and people come to the altar, I feel the Lord say to me, Pastor Brad, we're going to be like an army that's marching around the walls of Jericho. And as we begin to speak the name of Jesus, walls are going to come down. Miracles are going to happen. Breakthroughs are going to happen. Now, some of you are like, I don't need a miracle, but my son needs a miracle. My mama needs a miracle. You get up here and you stand for them and believe for their miracle. Come on, you need a miracle? Come on, come on, come on right now. Come on, come on, come on. Run to this altar. Come and lift your hands before God. And we're going to speak the name of Jesus. So come on, Woodville, as people come, prophetically declare the song. Prophetically sing the name of Jesus over these situations. When you come to the altar, get as close as you can. Close as you can, because there's going to be many more. They're going to try to get to this altar. Come on, church, lift your voice. Sing it to the Lord. I speak the name of Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
Church, lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands. Pastor, just sing that part. Your name is power. Name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Come on, lift your hands. Sing it again. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Thank you, Jesus. 
Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. So break every stronghold. Strongholds are breaking, church. something specific I need to pray for before this service closes but I want you to take your emblems and peel back the first layer you've got a little wafer it represents the body of Jesus Jesus said do this in remembrance of me let's partake of the wafer that represents the body of Jesus Just peel back the second layer. The juice represents his blood. Blood represents life. Anybody glad that Jesus gave his life for us? Amen. Let's partake of the juice. Church, just a couple of minutes, this service is going to close. So you need to go get your kids, but this altar remain open. But before I pray, can we celebrate again salvations in this place today? Come on. If you gave your heart to Jesus, I want you to drop by that follow band. And if you're a guest, I want you to go to the guest band. And if you've come prepared to give of your tithes and offerings, there'll be buckets in the back on the way out, debit machines in the lobby. All our giving options are online. But here's what I feel the Lord wants me to pray, is that the gifts that are in us will be stirred up. 
Uh, you just need to hear me. What God's doing is way beyond any person. And God has been saying to me, all hands on deck. And I feel I need to pray that the Lord would stir up the gifts that are in us. That we would move from an audience to an army. So come on, lift your hands all across this place. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that every gift would be fanned to life in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that every gift would be raised up and, to, and Lord, it would be discovered and developed and deployed in the name of Jesus. I pray that the apostolic anointing would flow. I pray that the prophetic anointing would flow. I pray that the evangelist would be the evangelist. The teacher would teach. God, I pray the leaders would lead in the name of Jesus. I pray everyone would rise up in the name of the Lord. We pray in this last day revival in the name of the Lord that you would stir up the gifts in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that we would pass the baton to the, to the next generation and we would see a generation rise, risen up in the name of the Lord with a rich anointing of the living God upon them. We pray for all of our boys and girls in the children's wing. Lord, let the fire of God burn in them in the name of Jesus. God, give us a great day. Give us a great week. And we give you now all the glory and the honor and the praise. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout it, amen. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you'd like to stay for prayer, you stay as long as you want. There'll be a team of altar workers here. But pastor, as we go, lead us in that song again, speaking the name of Jesus. God bless you, church.